The words to which I should like to call your attention are to be found in the Gospel according to St. John in the third chapter and the eighth verse. The eighth verse of the third chapter of the Gospel according to St. John. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Now what we are doing is to consider the manifestations of the life which enters into all those who are born of the Spirit. To be born of the Spirit means to be born again, to be born from above, to become a partaker of the divine nature. And what our Lord is telling that great man, that great teacher of the Jews, Nicodemus, at this point is that this is the thing that rarely differentiates the Christian message, the Christian faith, not only from the old religion of the Jews, but from everything else. This is the essence of Christianity. It's not merely belief in a teaching of philosophy, it's not merely a moral living, it's not merely being religious. It is that one is born again, that one receives something of this life from God. And as this is so important and so crucial, as our Lord here makes so clear in his address to uh, Nicodemus, well, nothing is more important for us than to know of a surety and of a certainty that this has happened to us, that we really are people who have been born of the Spirit, born again, born from above. No man is a Christian by natural birth. No man uh, can uh, produce uh, what makes a man a Christian in himself. John has reminded us already in the first uh, chapter that this is altogether of God. He says, as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And here he's saying it again and putting it uh, still uh, more plainly and clearly. Indeed, our Lord himself is putting it uh, to us here in his teaching to Nicodemus. And therefore, we are examining ourselves in the light of this statement. And the way, of course, to do so is this, is to consider what we are told in the Bible are the manifestations of this new life from God, which is given to those who are Christian. And we have seen that there are many, many tests. We have arrived now at one of the most important of all. We are trying to proceed on a kind of ascending scale, taking the big, the broad, obvious things first, and then narrowing it down in one sense but only in the sense that we are concentrating more on this vital matter of a personal knowledge of and a personal relationship to God. Now, we began doing this last Sunday morning. And I uh, said that um, there is no better test than this. This, indeed, in many ways is the ultimate test, that we have an increasing awareness that the ultimate end and object of salvation is to bring us to this direct and immediate and personal knowledge of God. The great characteristic of the Christian faith, as against all other religions, is that it is internal, not external. Of course, there's the objective aspect, but the mark always of a truly Christian life is this inner life, this inner growth, you take that phrase that the Apostle Paul used in the third chapter of the Epistle to the Ephesians that we read just now, this inner man, that Christ, that you may be strengthened by his power, by the Spirit in the inner man. That's the thing. So that what I'm really saying in another sense is this, that uh, one becomes aware of the fact that one has an inner man. 
The Christian is aware of this inner man within him. Nobody else is. The life of the man who is not a Christian is in one sense just a one piece. He's just one man. And that's the same man whether you outward or inward. Indeed, the whole tragedy of the man who has not received this new life is that, as I say, he's not aware of this inner life, this inner man, this inner being. You see, the New Testament describes the Christian in this way, that it's this inner man that matters, and that the body, for instance, is nothing but a tent. The body is a kind of tent in which we live for a while. It isn't the body that's important. It's merely the place in which this inner man of ours uh, dwells uh, while he's here in this world of time. But now, you take the man who's not a Christian, the man who knows nothing about this life, well, to him, his life is rarely just one, and it's all the life that is in the flesh. The body is essential. He can't conceive of himself apart from it. The only life he knows is this kind of... Uh, soulish, psychical life, call it what you will, the life that is uh, entirely made up of uh, relationships with men and women. And it's all entirely dependent upon that. He's dependent upon them for his interest, for his happiness, for his pleasure, for his everything. And when he's bereft of these things, he's completely lost and he is without any comfort and consolation. But the moment a man becomes a Christian, a new man comes into being, an inner man, the spiritual man. Now, this is, the, this is the man, of course, that is concerned about this knowledge of God. The Christian is a man, again, to use the language of the Apostle Paul in the second epistle to the Corinthians and in chapter 4. He says, though our outward men perish, the inward man is renewed day by day. That's it. That's what I mean by saying that this is internal, not merely external. Religion is always external, as morality is external. It's always interested in the surface, but the spiritual, the unseen, is always internal, this inner, inward man. And the great characteristic of this man is that he desires this personal knowledge of God. As I said last Sunday, he is, that's the thing he's most interested in, more interested than he is in religious duties, more interested than he is in theology, more interested than even in blessings. This is the chief end of salvation. Christ died for us, says Peter, to bring us to God. This is life eternal, says our Lord again, that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Very well. Now, the Christian, I say, is a man who realizes that this is possible in this life. That the knowledge of God is not something postponed until the life after death. It starts here. It is possible in this life. I've quoted in times past one of the old Puritans of over 300 years ago who left this as his dying statement, something that he wanted to bequeath to all his relatives and all who knew him, God dealeth familiarly with men. He only discovered that just at the end of his life. He'd been preaching these things, but there he had a great experience. And he said, I leave this as my dying gift. God dealeth familiarly with men. In other words, though he is a God afar off, he is a God who is also nigh. As our in puts it, center and soul of every sphere, yet to each loving heart. How near? Now that's it. And the, the, this man, uh, with this new life, this inner man, this new man, is a man who has uh, discovered that God, the everlasting and eternal, is in this sense near. The high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy, who nevertheless dwells with the humble and the contrite heart, as Isaiah puts it. Well now then, to proceed, this is something which is regarded by this new man as the highest privilege in his life. 
and it therefore becomes, of course, the chief object of his life. We all know what it is to desire to have more and more of the company of certain people. The desire to talk to people, mix with people who are in exalted and high positions and things like that. Well, if that is so on the natural level, it's infinitely more so on this level. And so you will find that the great characteristic of the people of God in the Old Testament as well as in the New, but more in the New than in the Old as one would expect, because of all that has been done now in and through our blessed Lord, is this desire. And here you get it expressed, for instance, by David. As the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? Now, that's a desire, you see, for this communion with God, as he puts it, the living God. The God, uh, let's be quite clear about this, the God of the theologian may very well be a dead God. That's the whole danger of a purely intellectual approach. The God of the philosophers is certainly a dead God. He's an abstraction, the absolute, the ultimate, the very terms they use about him display the fact that they, they don't know the living God. But here is a man who with the whole of his being is longing for the living God. As the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. Now, here's not a man who is concerned about an intellectual knowledge and apprehension. His heart is involved, his feelings, his sentiments... The whole of his being is crying out, My soul thirsteth for God, the living God. And there is no more important uh, distinction than just that. You remember, don't you, that great experience of Blaise Pascal. He says exactly the same thing when he had that great experience. The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, not of the philosophers, he says. Now, he was a brilliant philosopher, an astounding thinker, brilliant mathematician. And he had philosophized a lot about God and about these matters. But when he had this experience of the living God, well, he's overwhelmed and he knows that he's having the experience, the kind of experience that had been vouchsafed to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. He knew his Old Testament. And he knew how God had appeared to these men. God had appeared to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. And they knew they'd been in contact with the living God. Take that experience of Jacob at Peniel, which we read at the beginning out of Genesis 32. There is a man, you see, aware that he now is rarely dealing with the living God. And he will not let him go. This is the greatest thing he's ever known. He'd had a great experience before. A Bethel. But here is something that goes even further. And it's the thing which gives us an insight and an understanding into the whole life and character of that man, Jacob. And Pascal realizes that he's now in the same dimension. No longer theorizing, philosophizing, talking and arguing about God. And concerned about the proofs of the being of God. They're all right as far as they go. But once a man has the experience of the living God, he doesn't need the other proofs. He knows. It is this immediacy. And uh, there is nothing that is comparable to this. So you get Job crying out, Oh, that I knew where I might find him. Now, I'm simply putting these phrases before you, my dear friends, in order that we all may ask ourselves certain questions. Have you ever asked that question? Have you ever felt like that? Have you ever uttered that ejaculation? Oh, that I knew where I might find him. Seeking him, searching him. Oh, love divine, how sweet thou art. When shall I find my willing heart all taken up by thee? That, that, that becomes increasingly the desire, the deepest biggest desire of the life. Now you see the importance of putting these questions. 
You see the difference between religion and this vital, true thing that is always a manifestation of life. It's a good thing to come like this on Sunday morning to the house of God. But my dear friends, don't we all know from experience and mustn't we all admit and confess that we've often done it quite mechanically because we believe in general it's a right thing to do and to worship God and so on. But the question is, oh, do we come to meet with him? Do we come because of this desire to find him? Do we come with that kind of eagerness with which uh, Jacob struggled and wrestled on that occasion at Peniel because he wanted the blessing that God alone can give? This becomes, you see, the chief thing. Jacob had many other concerns on that occasion. You remember, you read the story for yourselves. He was going to meet his brother Esau. And there was a danger that he might lose all his goods and possessions, and that meant a great deal to Jacob. But you know, the moment he meets with this other, he forgets all about his goods and possessions and everything else. Nothing matters but this. All I'm trying to say is this, that one of the tests always of the possession of this life is that it does become the supreme thing. It's bigger than everything else in our lives. I quoted to you last Sunday the Apostle Paul at the height of his experience still crying out that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. Now, the danger is, of course, that the devil may come to us at this point and say, well, that's all right. That's all right for the people in the Bible, but it's got nothing to do with you. And we often fail to know these things because we listen to that suggestion of the devil and there's a great tendency to do this. Oh, that was only for the patriarchs, they were special people, only for the apostles, special people, only for the first Christians, special people. And so, we exclude a great deal of the whole of the Bible. But it's not true. This is something that God's people have gone on experiencing throughout the centuries. And it's not confined to any particular type the psychologists will tell you, oh, yes, of course, that's all right. We like to read about these things. There is that mystical type of person, but we're not all like that, you know. There is such a thing as a religious complex, a religious temperament. There are certain people who are so constituted by nature that naturally they go in for that kind of thing. It's all right for them, but you mustn't say that we're all to know that. Well, that again is the lie of the devil. It's got nothing to do with natural makeup. Why? Well, because here we are born again. That's born of the flesh. There are such differences. I'm very ready to grant it. All sorts of types and kinds. You get your mystical type in a natural sense. I agree. A psychic type and so many others. The phlegmatic type, scientific type. But here, you see, we are, we've left all that. Born not of the will of the men, not of flesh, but of God. New birth, born of the Spirit. So it is the impress of the Spirit. It's the life of the Spirit. And this is available for all of us. So you mustn't evade it and divide it by trying to explain it away in some such clever terms. This is something that is to be true of all God's people. So you, you listen to a man living in the last century who puts it like this, I see thee not. I hear thee not. Yet thou art oft with me, and earth has, hath ne'er so dear a spot as where I meet with thee. Now that's it. He doesn't uh, see. He hasn't had a vision. He doesn't hear. He doesn't hear words. And yet the thing is real. Yet thou art oft with me, and earth hath ne'er so dear a spot as where I meet with thee. And I could give you many other quotations indicating the same thing. All I'm saying is this, that if you know anything at all about such a desire or are able to utter such a sentiment, it is an absolute proof that you are born of the Spirit, that you have the life of God in you. And the thing is obvious, isn't it? The man of the world, he's not interested in knowing God. Never thought of this. God is an abstraction to him, everything so vague. This is only uh, something that is known 
of those who truly have been born of the Spirit. But let me put it like this to you. This man is a man, this inner man, this inward man, is one who finds in himself an increasing interest in the three blessed persons of the Holy Trinity, in and of themselves, and for their own sake. Now, I'm developing the point which I mentioned in passing last Sunday morning when I said that this man is more concerned about this personal knowledge even than he is of receiving blessings. And this is a most important point. An increasing interest in the persons as such, the persons for themselves. What do I mean? Well, let me put it like this and let us take it in the experimental order. Let us uh, take, uh, let us start therefore with uh, the Son of God, the second person in the Blessed Holy Trinity. Here is a very good way of testing ourselves. Are we interested in our Lord himself? Now, we are all interested in the benefits of salvation. We all want forgiveness. We want to be delivered from sins. We want happiness and so on. All right, it's quite all right. It's perfectly legitimate. I'm not saying anything against that. But what I am saying is this, that if you stop at it, you may be deluded. Because in various ways, that can be counterfeited by the enemy. But this is something I say he will never do. And that is create an interest in our Lord himself. Now, the Holy Spirit was sent to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore... The ultimate test of a work of the Spirit within, all the work of the Spirit indeed is this, that it leads us to a greater interest in the person himself. So I mean something like this. Now, you'll find this in the Scriptures, and you'll find it particularly also in the hymn books. You will find an increasing interest in the very glory of his person. The man of God, the saint, likes to dwell upon and to meditate upon the very glory of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. He meditates about this. He thinks about him. He likes to think of him in his eternal and everlasting glory with the Father before time. He likes to read these descriptions of him that are given in the scriptures in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and then he turns uh, to the first chapter of the epistle uh, to the Hebrews, and he finds God who at sundry times, and in divers manners spake in times past to the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power. He likes to meditate about that and to think about that. Now, these, I say, are the marks of this new life. And they're surely inevitable. If we really do believe the message of the Christian gospel, that all has come to us through the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, very well then, you want to know something about him. Now, take the human analogy once more. If somebody's being kind to you, or you've heard of somebody who's done you a kindness, or if you've heard of somebody who's done something wonderful in any realm, the first thing you say is, I'd like to meet that person. I'd like to get to know him. You, you know what he's done. But you're not content with it because you know what he's done. That creates a desire. You, you want to meet him. I'd like to see him. I'd like to know what he's like. I'd like to know what kind of personality he is, what kind of person he is. That's how we do on the natural level. It's exactly the same here. And so one becomes interested in the glory of this blessed person. You can't grasp it, of course. But you take these descriptions and you realize that they're true, and you're amazed at them, and you're astounded at them. And then you go on. And you begin to ask yourself, well, very well, is that the, the Lord Jesus Christ? Is that the one who died for me on the cross? How did this ever come to pass? 
So you begin to think of and to rejoice in the marvel and the glory of the incarnation. Ah, you see, we're obviously here doing something. But the men, the natural men, however clever, however brilliant he may be, knows nothing at all about. He may be interested in the thing as a, an item in theology or a philosophical log, but he's, he, he has this personal interest. But this man, because he's got this life in him, he has this personal interest. So he now likes to look at and to meditate upon the incarnation. So he turns to Philippians 2, and he reads this kind of thing, and he's astounded at it, and he revels in it. He reads, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. And do you see, he, he says, now what does that mean? He wants to analyze this. He wants to know what it means. And he finds out that what it means is this. That there he was in the eternal glory, the second person in the blessed Holy Trinity. It was his right. It was his prerogative. He was the Son of God. Everything had been made through him. And without him had nothing been made that was made. But this is the thing. For us men and our redemption, and in order that we might be made the sons of God. He doesn't hold on to that. That's what it means. Thought it not robbery to be equal with God. The real meaning of that is, did not regard it as a prize to be held on to, to be clutched on to. He didn't say, well, I can't leave this. This is so marvelous, and I can't leave the enjoyment of this. He didn't do that. He humbled himself. He made himself of no reputation. He laid aside the signs of that glory. He came on earth. He made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. The word, the everlasting eternal word was made flesh, literally, and dwelt among us. Now this to this man is the most amazing and astounding thing. He likes to think about it. He likes to meditate about it. He likes to dwell upon it. And then he watches him in his life and in his works. He reads his Gospels with an entirely new eye. Not merely a matter of history. Not merely something that happened in the past. But he's now got a living interest in it. It's all the difference between reading about somebody who belongs to history and who doesn't belong to you or family, and reading about somebody whom you know and love intimately and who belongs to you and you to him. You're reading it with a new interest, his life and works, and you like to watch him as he deals with people, as he deals with the poor, the publicans and sinners and the reviled, and as he deals with the Pharisees and scribes and the authorities. You're watching him the whole time. And then you look at him upon the cross. And you meditate about these things. You dwell upon his dying on the cross. Look at the Apostle Paul. God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of my Lord Jesus Christ. The distinction I'm trying to draw is this. It is one thing to believe uh, the theory about the death of our Lord, or to believe it as a fact, and rarely to glory in it. Here is the test. You can believe in it intellectually, but you'll never glory in it intellectually. And the man who's got life in him knows something about glorying in it. He can say where the whole realm of nature mine, that were an offering far too small. Love so amazing, so divine demands my soul, my life, my all. He's taken up. God forbid that I should glory. He surveys the wondrous cross. Now this is something that only the man with new life in him knows anything at all about. You see, it's no longer external. You don't need to put up crosses, therefore, in your churches. You've got it in your heart. You're looking at it spiritually. You're looking at it internally. It's become everything to you. And this has been the characteristic of God's people throughout the centuries. And then, you like to think of him not only dying and being buried, but rising again, the glory of the resurrection.
Does it thrill us? Does it amaze us and astound us? Does it lift us up, as it were, and put us into a kind of ecstasy, as it clearly does with these people? And then we think of him reigning in heaven. Oh, my dear friends, isn't this the cause of most of our troubles? We are trying, as it were, to bring ourselves into a belief of these things. There is no verse, I sometimes think and have often said, that is so misinterpreted as Romans 6.11. Reckon ye yourselves, therefore, as dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through our Lord Jesus Christ. People have turned that into a psychological process. They are reckoning it, persuading themselves. It doesn't mean that at all. Know that it's true. Realize that it's true. It's happened. And it becomes something vital. And then you go on and you realize that he's there at the right hand of God, seated there in the glory everlasting. You are in trouble. You are in difficulties. And there you are trying to work up a faith, trying to apply something. Don't do it, my friend. Go to him. Realize he's there. It isn't a self-persuasion. It is a going to him, glorying in the fact that he's there. And he said, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. He's seated at the right hand of God, waiting until his enemies shall be made his footstool. You see, this is really the great argument of the epistle to the Hebrews. Why does this man write this great epistle to the Hebrews? There's only one answer. These people had become depressed. They were unhappy. They were being persecuted. They were being tried. They were having a very hard time. And they were beginning to become shaky in their faith. They were becoming doubtful of everything. And this man writes to say one big thing to them, though he takes 13 chapters to do it. He works it out in detail to drive it home to them at every point. This is what he's saying. He says, all your troubles are due to the fact that you're not clear about him. So he bursts out, you see, without any introduction. God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in times past to the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us in his Son. That's what you've forgotten, he says, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. You are looking at your persecutors. You are saying they've robbed us of our goods. They're treating us very harshly. They're very unkind to us. Listen, he says, he who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Look at him, he says, looking unto Jesus. Dwell upon that. Don't look at your enemies and your difficulties and your problems. Realize that he's there and he's got all power. He's waiting until he makes his enemies his footstool. Now, my dear friends, are these the things that occupy your mind and your heart and your interest? This, I say, is a sign of being born again, of having life, that you meditate upon your high priest above. And that you realize that he's there in all his glory at this present hour. You see the difference, don't you? Oh, yes. I took my salvation. I responded to the appeal. I went forward. I took Christ as my Savior. My sins are forgiven. I'm all right now. I just go on. Is it only that? It sounds as if you were doing everything. And that you're resting on something you did in the past. Where is he? Where does he come in? Where's your personal relationship to him? Where is your personal reliance on him? Where is your personal glorying in him? Now this is the mark of the new life, that this personal aspect becomes more and more evident. Well, let me put it to you like this. Look at this thing that I'm trying to talk about in the writings of the Apostle Paul. And you'll see exactly what I mean. The apostle may be engaged in a bit of argumentation. He had to because of the state of the people. And he is working out something. And then in doing it, he mentions the name of Jesus or of Christ or the Lord Jesus Christ. And invariably, it fires him. Off he goes to some great apostrophe, some ascription of praise and glory and worship and adoration. Forgets all his grammar, forgets his own argument and has to come back to it by putting in a dash, as it were. Oh, they say he's guilty of an act of Luther. Thank God he is. It's because he's in love with the person. And everything else is forgotten. If you like, and to use such terms, you can call it a Christ mysticism. 
there is such a thing as a Christian mysticism. I said last Sunday that one of the greatest enemies was mysticism, and it is. I mean by that a philosophic mysticism. But here you've got what you may have a call a Christ mysticism. And the apostle, whenever he thinks of this blessed name, this blessed person, he's transported. He bursts out. He can't contain himself. His language becomes inadequate because of the glory and the blessedness of the person. It's invariable. But again, let's be very careful that we don't allow the enemy to sidetrack us by saying, oh, yeah, but after all, the apostle Paul was a very exceptional person. That's the argument, isn't it? We tend to evade all these things by, oh, yeah, of course, always somebody exceptional, not meant for me. My friend, that's the lie of the devil. There is no such distinction in the scripture at all. The apostle was always at great pains to say that he is a man saved like everybody else. Well, we had it this morning. He says he is the less than the least of all saints. He says in writing to the Corinthians that he's not worthy to be called an apostle at all because he persecuted the church of Christ. And what he's always telling us is this, that everything that he has known, we can also know. I not mean That doesn't mean that we shall see the Lord with the naked eye. That was peculiar because he was to be an apostle, a witness of the resurrection. But otherwise, always his argument is that this is something that we are all to enjoy together because it is his giving that matters and not our receptivity nor any ability that is in us. Now that is of the very essence of this matter and thank God it is. We must get rid of this carnal thinking. We mustn't bring in here our various gifts. Here we are in a realm where they don't matter. I mean our natural gifts. That's what makes the worship of God such a unique thing. In the world, your natural gifts and abilities, intellect and so on, they're all of great importance and of great value. But the moment you come in here, they're not only of no value, they can be your greatest danger. No man has an advantage over any other here. Why? Oh, it is all the free gift of God. It is all the grace of God. It is all the operation of the Holy Spirit. It is all this seed of divine life that is put into us, and the life is in the seed. So that this is something that is equally possible to all of us. And so, when you come down the centuries, you find this testimony coming out, this repetition of the experience and the bursts of worship and of adoration that we find in the apostles. You find it in your hymn books. Read your hymn books, my dear friends, and you'll find this coming out, how sweet The name of Jesus sounds in a believer's ear. It soothes his sorrows, heals his wounds, and drives away his fear. Is that true of us? How sweet the name of Jesus sounds, does it? Now, I'm not talking about repeating it mechanically. I'm saying that it sounds sweet. And so sweet at times that one is rendered speechless. Or listen to another. Jesus, the very thought of thee with sweetness fills my breast. But sweeter far thy face to see and in thy presence rest. Is that true of us? Have we this interest in the person? Apart from what he's done for us, the person himself, do we seek him? Listen again to another. Charles Wesley, thou, O Christ, art all I want, more than all in thee I find. Is that true of us? Do we know anything about that? Does he satisfy us? Have we such a knowledge of the person that that is true to our experience? Thou, O Christ, art all I want, more than all in thee I find. Is that how you feel at this moment? Does he give you complete satisfaction? My Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine. For for thee the pleasures of sin I resign. Gladly. Of course. It's inevitable. And as I say, the saints have cried out like this throughout the centuries. 
Oh, that I could forever sit like Mary at the Master's feet, be this my happy choice. My only care, delight and bliss, my joy, my heaven on earth, be this, to hear the Master's voice. Now, you will read of some people at different times in the history of the church, in whose case all this was so true, that they dwelt so much upon the person and the glory of the person and the wonder and the amazement of what he had done, and especially the cross, that it is said of some of them that they developed what are called stigmata. Some are said to have meditated so much upon the cross and the nails in his hands and so on that marks appeared in their own hands. Well, you needn't be concerned about that. I simply mention it to show you. That, that ordinary people, Christian people, once this life grows and develops and matures in them, that it brings them to this position in which they not only desire this personal knowledge, but have it to such a degree that he's so real to them that they do enter into the fellowship of his sufferings. And that's the thing the Apostle Paul was talking about, wasn't it, in Philippians 3.10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death, that you enter into such a union with him that you partake, as it were, of his sufferings. Indeed, the apostle in the first chapter of the epistle to the Colossians even talks about making up what remains of the sufferings of Christ. Here is an identity in which one really enters even into a sharing of his sufferings. Well, I leave it at that, but I leave it in the form of a question. How long have you been a Christian? How many years? Have you an increasing interest in the person, an increasing desire to know him as a person, personally? And do you glory more and more in him as a person? And then we... We go on and we say the same thing about the Father. Here is a great mystery, but there have been many saints in the church who have testified that they know what it is to have separate communion with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. All I'm asking is, have we this personal interest in the Father? Do we like to think about his being and his attributes? Well, you see, the Bible again is full of this. The thought of God and of the glory of God and of the being of God. We can't conceive of God. No man hath seen God at any time. That isn't what it means. But the Christian is a man who knows that God is personal. It's not an abstraction. Not just the ground of being or even love. No, no, God is personal. You see, these men in the Bible have met him, the living God. They have come near him. Moses was given a view of his back parts, as the scripture puts it. God places his hand upon him when he's in the cleft of the rock and passes by. And Moses is given just a glimpse of the back parts of God. And so the Christian, this new man, he likes to think about this and to meditate about it. Have you ever noticed it in our hymn book? You've got the classification here, I was working this thing out, and I suddenly found myself thinking about it. This is an excellent hymn book, if it were only for this reason. Contents. First heading, The Eternal Father. And then the subdivisions, praise and adoration. God the Father. You see, you're no longer thinking of God as just some sort of agency that gives you blessings. God is someone to whom you turn when you're in trouble. No, no, you, you delight in him, you want to know him, and you delight in thinking about him and all his infinite absolute attributes, the attributes of God. What's gone wrong with us Christian people? You know, 300 years ago, men used to write books on the attributes of God, and they preached on them for months and months, and the people delighted to hear them. But we today, no, no, we are so practical. We, we want the, the, the short. The, we don't think about God in his glorious attributes. We're just interested in blessings and experiences and in our own activities. We've gone seriously astray. Praise and adoration. His works in creation, his providence, his grace in redemption, all I'm asking is, 
Do we have these divisions in our mind? Do we like to think of the everlasting and eternal God existing in eternity, deciding for some amazing reason to create the world and to create man, to have man as a companion for himself? Do you think about this? Do you meditate about this? This glorious God and then all his great purposes, how he governs by his providence, how he has provided for us. The psalmists write their psalms about this. Read the 104th Psalm sometime today, and you'll see the psalmist glorying in the providence of God in nature and in creation. And then you come on especially to God in history, but above all to God in redemption. The plan and the purpose of God before the foundation of the world. Watch the apostles dealing with that, bringing it out, reminding themselves of it. Amazed at it, Paul says to the Corinthians who are boasting about their wisdom, their philosophy, their cleverness. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the hidden wisdom of God in a mystery, even this hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. And you see, he's gone off into his ecstasy. Do we know what it is to accompany him? We think of this hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Oh, I'm simply asking as I close whether this is true of us, the worship of God, the contemplation of God, the adoration of God. Ye mortal, ye invisible, God only wise. Watch these great hymns at the beginning of the hymn book. In many ways, they're the greatest hymns in the whole of the book. And they should be sung thoughtfully with meditation, giving full value to every word and every phrase. The glory of the eternal God. Take that great hymn we sang at the beginning, the God of Abraham praise enthroned in worlds above, ancient of everlasting days of God of love. Listen to him as he puts it at the end. Hail Abraham's God and mine. That's the thing. Abraham's God and mine, the same God. And he's my God and I glory in him as Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob did. Oh, worship the King, all glorious above. Oh, gratefully sing his power and his love. He's pavilioned in splendor and girded with praise. You see, language becomes totally inadequate. Oh, measureless might, ineffable love. While angels delight To him the above, the humbler creation, though feeble their lays, with sweet adoration shall sing to thy praise. Oh, my friends, all I'm asking you is, do you delight in doing so? Do you delight in singing his praise? I don't mean being carried away by a tune. I mean that the words to you are glorious that you thrill with the thought of them and that this has become your knowledge and that your heart is possessed by these things. These are tests of life. No longer the cold intellectual abstractions, no longer the distant thoughts of a legal God who is interested in your moralisms, but Abraham's God and mine, my God. Very well, God willing, we shall go on to consider this further next Sunday morning. But these are the things by which we live, who have received the life of God in our souls as the result of being born of the Spirit. Now let us join in singing our closing hymn, which is hymn number 182, the hymn of John Newton, I partly quoted just now, 182. How sweet the name of Jesus sounds in a believer's ear. 182.
We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.